And Pastor Tony last week uh, kicked off a new series called This Generation. How many were here last week? How many were not? No, you don't have to raise your hand. If you were on Facebook Live, you probably saw what it was going on, and it was uh, very to the point. It's a series that meant to help us understand the urgency of this generation and an awareness of the last days. So the series began in Matthew chapter 24. Pastor Tony gave clarity on the scripture concerning the signs of the last days. You probably remember that. Uh, he only gave two points, but they were very direct. Um, he was talking about the last days and the evident neglect of this generation not to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. He said it this way. He said, uh, to rise above the apathy of this generation, and he challenged us also to rise to the opportunity of this generation. So we're going to continue this series, hopefully, <clears throat> on this generation. And we're going to be talking about investing in this generation for the increase of the kingdom. You all with me? So remember that. Investing in this generation for the increase of the kingdom. Um, by way of introduction, we're going to continue the series by going back to Matthew chapter 24, okay? So if you have your Bible app, break it out. Uh, if your spouse has fallen asleep already, nudge them, all right? If you have uh, the, your Bible in hand, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> and we'll look at this together. So in this portion of Scripture, Jesus is continuing his precepts uh, concerning his second coming. He is... Uh, uh, he's, uh, he sat his disciples down, and he's at the Mount of Olives. And he is teaching them how to best prepare for his coming. And it's interesting that he chose the Mount of Olives because of this platform, his teaching, considering it's, uh, it's here that the second coming of Jesus will have a prominent role. It's very unique, but it wasn't by accident. He had a reason for this. So he dedicates chapter 24 and 25 just to prepare the disciples, and us for the coming in of himself, Jesus. So, we're going to look at it, all right? Let's, um, <clears throat> let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 24, and we'll look at 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, which is Jesus, speaking to the disciples and us to, uh, to us as well, who then is faithful and wise servant who is the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? <clears throat> the question is asked. Verse 46. Blessed is that servant, who his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Actually, find him doing the work that was given to him. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him rule over all his goods, his wealth. Verse 48. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, notice the word heart, that's very important, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and, dr uh, and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Verse 51, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the what? The hypocrites. The hypocrites. Then shall the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, <clears throat> Jesus has brought our attention to this. He's brought up the facts and gave it to his disciples. There are two types of servants. He says those that choose to follow Christ, the faithful, those that are doing. And he says those who do not, the evil, the ones that delay. And I am a firm believer the ones that delay are those that represent the people that have heard the truth but do nothing with it. They, it's the people that God has given them the opportunity to accept the truth and run with the ball, but they chose not to. So the teaching of Christ on the Mount of Olives continues in chapter 25. And, and so Jesus gives a comparison of his coming again by using two parables. It's very interesting how he does it. Uh, if you're not familiar with a parable, it's just a simple story that that illustrates what Christ is trying to say. Um, a parable is often a significant comparison between two objects that may be used as a mere image to teach a single concept. It's an illustration. It's a, it's a lesson, a picture, if you would. Everybody with me? Raise your hand if you are. If you're kind of with me, raise both hands, all right? Okay, that's okay. God bless you. We'll help you. All right, so, so here there are two parables in chapter 25. We're not going to focus on the first parable. 
but we do need to mention it. Uh, the first parable is called uh, so often the parable of the ten virgins or the wise and foolish virgins. Some people, when they hear that, they're like, what? That's kind of weird. You know, for us today, it may seem weird, but at the time of Christ for a Jewish wedding, it was not. Uh, the virgins represented the bridesmaids, and they were the ones that were preparing the way for the groom when he returns. See, the groom has left to go prepare the home and the place for his bride. Very symbolic of Jesus. He has left, and as the Bible said, I go to prepare a place for you, but he will return. So <clears throat> the virgins here, there's five that were wise and five that were foolish. And they have their lamps, their lanterns, if you would. Because when the groom returns, there's going to be a, a perception, a perception. There's going to be a parade, if you would. There could be a perception, I don't know. And, and they're going to lead that groom through the town. And, and, and when they do, they are going to be so excited. It's going to be in a, a party. And they're going to get to a, a location where the groom meets with the bride, and there's a dinner, and in celebration, the doors will be closed, and the following day, they will be married. They were to be ready at all times for the coming of the groom, but five were not. Five grabbed their lanterns, ran out, and said, he's here. And the other five say, we're not ready. I just didn't think he would come back already. I mean, we have some oil, but not enough. Can you give us some of your oil? And they're like, what? No, we're not going to give you our oil. We've been waiting. The whole purpose of this parable is those that are waiting and also those that are not prepared. So they said, go buy your own oil. Fill your lamps. And so they're like, okay. So they left. And so they make their way through the city. They arrive at where the feast will be. They shut the doors and the five show up knocking on the door and say, hey, we got our oil. We're ready. And the groom opens the door and says, it's basically too late. Closes the door. What is the purpose of the first parable? The parable of the virgins deals with the fate of the unprepared, but it also deals with the waiting of the return of Christ, those that are prepared. So it's a picture for us as believers what we are to do while waiting for the return of our king. Also, now, with that in mind, we look at the second parable. Is everybody with me? It's another way of looking at the preparation for the return of Jesus Christ. The parable of the talents. It deals with the tragedy of a wasted opportunity. And the parable also deals with a positive aspect. Deals with the working until the return of the Lord. The first parable is dealing with the waiting. The second parable is dealing with the working. He covers everything. Isn't Jesus awesome the way he covers everything? Don't be confused because a talent is not what we think of. It's not the ability to do something well in the sense of playing basketball, an instrument, singing. A talent was a, uh, an amount of money that was issued. And so we'll get into that in just a minute and we'll look at that together. It is the second parable in Matthew chapter five, 25, the parable of the talents that we will be focusing on as we continue this series the series of this generation, investing in this generation for the increase of the kingdom. So is everybody with me so far? I like things easy, so I want to make sure we're on the same page. So uh, in order for us to uh, increase, or excuse me, to increase the kingdom but invest in this generation, there has to be some things we clearly understand. So let's break down this portion of scripture and make sure everybody's on the same page, okay? Okay. Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, is the beginning of the parable. So I'm going to sum it up before we get into it, because we're going to go verse by verse. The Bible says there was a certain man, and this man was going to travel into a far country, who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. So that certain man represents Jesus Christ. And this is a representation of after Jesus has risen from the dead, before his ascension into heaven, before he goes to the heavenly father, he meets with the disciples. And also this is directly speaking to us to give them some very important things, his goods, wealth. He wants them to take what he has and multiply it. So he meets with his servants, servants again representing his disciples and us as well, those that are followers of Christ. And he gives them this wealth in the form of a talent. A talent is a weight, a measurement of money. 
Each one was given a certain measurement, according, we'll see in a minute, according to their abilities. So they took that, and the king left. The master left. Also, this applies to us in the sense that Jesus is went to heaven, and he will return. And while he is gone, we are the servants, and we are to take what we have been given. We are to take the opportunities that we have been given to give the truth, to multiply, to increase, if you would, the kingdom of God. Is everybody with me? How do we do that? We have to reach those around us. Go, 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 and never stop. Because we know, according to Scripture, that Jesus is going to return, but we just don't know when. Same in this parable. The master does not tell the servants when he will return. So the servants have this long period of time to make a decision of what they're going to do with what was given to them. Their opportunity, if you would, their talents. And when he does return, he speaks to all three of them. The first one, he congratulates him, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because he invested what was given to him, those five talents. He multiplied it. He gave an increase for the kingdom. The second one had two, and he did the same. Third one, he was a weird guy. He took it and said, all right, see you later. And then he got a shovel and buried it. He only had one for good reason. Because <laughs> God's, I think he knew this guy wasn't really capable. It had the ability to do what the others could do. But he gave him an opportunity anyway. And he buried it. He confronted each one according to their work. So, now that we understand where we're going, we're going to jump into it. Are you all ready? Yeah. All right. 50 of you are on board. All right. Here we are. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants. The beginning of the parable is often overlooked. Most people say there's no significance to verse 14. They say what, what is happening in verse 14 is just the man before he leaves meets with the servants. I beg to differ. I believe there's something very important here for us to understand. The position of the first century servant was unique. Often they would become a part of the family. I believe this servant in this portion of Scripture is represented by the, uh, the individual we see as a servant in Exodus chapter 20, the bond servant. And he is the one that has free will, the ability to choose whatever direction he wants to go, but he chose to stay with the master. You know what's interesting about a servant? Another word for servant is slave. They're often put into the family after battle. You see, when they would go to war... The ones they would spare, often they would take back as servants. And over a period of time, if the relationship is right and they follow the master's leading and trust the master with all of their heart, there would be a bond there. And that bond would develop into a friendship. And that friendship would eventually develop into a family. It's very symbolic for us. Because we are the servants of the Lord. But before we were servants, we were in war against God. You say, no, I wasn't. Listen, we were serving our commander, the adversary, Satan. That's where we were. We were in darkness. We were going contrary to what God's teaching and leading is. We didn't want to accept it. We didn't want to acknowledge it. This is who we are. So we were in war against the master. And here's the interesting thing. The adversary, Satan was defeated when we gave our life to Christ. And this is called reconciliation. It's when God steps in and says, I've de defeated Satan, I've given you truth, you have embraced it, you have accepted it, now you have a choice to follow me as your master and love me as I'm going to love you. And that servant chooses to do so. And now he's part of the family. Reconciliation just is basically saying, a, a restoring a friendship, a fellowship, we, there's, there's, there's a separation between God and man because of sin. But when Satan is defeated and sin is overcame by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity by free will to accept him into our lives and become servants of the Lord. So when the Bible says <clears throat> in verse tw uh, 25, chapter 25, verse 14, that he called his own servants, it is important for us to understand we are that servant. We have been graciously granted the opportunity to serve the king. And Satan has lost the battle. And now we are part of the family of God. Within doing so, we have an opportunity to do some big things for God. So if we 
are going to invest in this generation for the increase of the kingdom, then we have to understand a servant is called, and we are that servant. He's called by the master, as we saw in the beginning of verse 14, but he also, he's not just called by the master, but it's for the master. Look at this. This is very important. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says, for, excuse me, who hath saved us, who saved us? God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. What kind of calling? Holy. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. It was the grace of God that we were pulled out of sin. It's the grace of God that we have an opportunity to serve the master, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. For the master means we're not doing it for ourselves. Now, let me clarify. It's for our good, though, in his glory. All we know in life is because God has given it to us. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We know that the things that we're experiencing as a believer, as a servant, is for God's purpose and our good. And in the end, he will be glorified and we will reap the benefits of it. Our purpose is to be a servant to fulfill the purpose of God's will. Is that, is that clear? So where are we at if we're going to reach this generation and invest in the kingdom? We are servants that are called. We're called by the master for the master, and it's a big deal because there's something he has in store for us. So let's continue. Second of all, a servant is entrusted. Matthew 25 and verse 14, the Bible says at the end of that passage of Scripture, and delivered unto them his goods. Key word there, goods. That's the, the master's wealth. The servant was given a responsibility, a great responsibility. He was entrusted with the responsibility of overseeing the master's wealth. The good were the abundance of wealth that he had. He was a a very, very rich man. But he chose these three servants to give them an opportunity, this responsibility to increase the kingdom by investing the wealth of his master or their master. The servant was representing the master. When the master left, They were the ones that represented the master. We represent the king of kings. We represent the master that was so gracious to allow us to be a part of his family because he died for us. He committed his love toward us. And and that's why we were yet sinners. That's what he did for us. Now, with that in mind, our responsibility is great too. It's called the Great Commission. We have been given and entrusted with a responsibility which is called the great, uh, the great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. Amen. This responsibility has been issued to us by our Master Jesus Christ. We are responsible for it till he comes again. So here we are as servants waiting on the master to return. And in our hands, we've been given a responsibility. We've been entrusted with a responsibility to take the truth and love and to increase the kingdom by reaching this generation. But it's according to our ability. I, I'm going to slow down right here and make sure everybody's on the same page. A servant is entrusted with great responsibility, but it's only according to their ability. Notice what the scripture says. Matthew 25, verse 15. And to, unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his what? Abilities. Does everybody follow me? Not everybody has the same ability. And straightway took his journey. What is a talent? It's a weight, large amount of money. In the form of gold, most likely in this passage of Scripture, silver. It's a sum of money, if you would. Most likely, this portion of Scripture, it was not just silver, but it could have been mixed with some gold. But the point is, is this, it was divided according to their ability. There's so many scholars that say so many things when it comes to a talent. Like, how much was it? I've heard some say it was the equivalence of 75 pounds of silver, equal to four years of wages. Others said it was much more than that. It was interesting. They're all over the place. You don't know who to trust. So others said that it, it, it's like the amount all together that all three received was the equivalence of a millionaire in today's terms. This was the weirdest one. 
Somebody said it, that portion of money, that weight, that bag, if you would, of silver was the equivalent of the weight of a small child or a child. That wouldn't help me. If I was a servant and my master's like, all right, we checked out a lot of kids and trying to figure out the weight we're going to give, I'd be like, I want the biggest kid you got. That's the weight I want for mine. Regardless of what they assume the weight may be, the point is it was a large amount of money, if you would, worth millions, that he entrusted with the servants. But he did it according to their ability. Every man according to his ability. So the five talents, the two talents, the one talent, various amounts were given according to each servant's ability, to every man according to his ability. Let me put it this way. I'd be like my dad when we were kids. There's three of us. Tony, Denny, and Dave. And it'd be like dad saying, hey guys, let's get together. We're, I'm going to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. There's some things that you need to do while I'm gone. And I'm going to give these responsibilities to you. And I want it to happen. I want, it to, I want you to increase the kingdom of Somerville, Alabama while I'm gone. So he looks at Denny and he says, he says uh, or, well, let's say me. He looks at me. And he says, Dave, you're my chosen son. (laughs) He said, Dave, you remind me of David in the Bible, a man after God's own heart. I wish you were the firstborn. I said, it's okay, Dad. We can't can't have everything. He says, I leave you with this responsibility that represents the five talents. Do it well. Because I know you're capable. You have a great responsibility, and I've given you much to deal with because... You are able to. I'm given this talent, which represents to some money, opportunity. It it represents your uh, ability to handle much. Then he looks over at Denny and said, you're okay, Denny. You're doing good. I know you're the oldest, but Dave trumps you. And you're going to get two talents, two. Because I know you're capable. Denny, you're going to multiply what I'm giving you. You have influence. And then he looks at Tony and he's like, yeah, you. <laughs> and he's like, Tony, we're still debating whether you were adopted or we don't know what happened, but you're here. And why do you have a shovel in your hand? And Tony gets the one talent according to his ability, you know, and he's like, <laughs> and so he walks off. <laughs> he's in bed right now. <laughs> he has no clue what we're doing or what I'm doing. And he buries it. Did you say he will? will. Ushers, escort this woman out. (laughs) And what does he do? He's entrusted with the one. What is the point? It was given to them according to their ability, but nobody was left out. Everybody was given something. Everybody is given an opportunity. But the opportunity that they were given is according to their what? Ability. Their ability, time, money, uh, authority, opportunity, that is the talent. But who can handle what? The Bible clarifies this in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 17, talking about the body of Christ. For as the, the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that body being what? Many. There's many parts to one body. But each one are unique. Each one is different, but it's unique in the way God designed it because he had a purpose for that body part. So when it comes to us, he said, there's many members, but you're working together. But one of the members can't look at the other and say, why can't I do that? Paraphrasing as he puts it in chapter 16. He says, what, 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 what sense does it make? And then verse 17, for, for the ear to look at, at the eye or the eye to look at the ear and say, I want to do that. And if I can't do it, I won't do anything. You have been given an opportunity. You've been given a talent according to your ability. You've been entrusted where you are at in life. And you must embrace it according to the abilities you have and run with it. It is as silly for us to try to take on more than we can handle by embracing areas that we were not made for. 
I was not designed necessarily to work directly with the homeless ministry, though I love them. And you may not have been designed to work with the children's ministry, though you love kids. Well, at least some of you do. We're all designed uniquely different. We all have abilities, and we've all been given an opportunity to use those abilities, but we were only given to what we can handle according to our ability. Is everybody with me? You are a servant. You have an opportunity according to your ability. It's as silly as going to the bathroom, you know, when you don't want to touch anything and you're trying to flush the toilet with your foot. You, how many have done that? And the bathroom is disgusting. And the next thing you know, you're just like, you're like got the Chuck Norris going on and you're like, yes. And some of you, it's like yoga because you never work out and every body part is stressing and you finally flip it, and at that time, you hit the floor, and everything you didn't want to touch with one finger is all over your body. <laughs> and it's almost like your hand wants to look down at the foot and go, what were you thinking? I've been here the whole time. I am uniquely created to flip that little switch called the lever, but yet you choose to do it with your toe. It's my job. You ain't making sandwiches, are you? You don't make sandwiches with your feet. You make it with your hand. Now, some of you think that's ridiculous, but that's what Jesus is saying about the church. We're like, I don't understand. He's a missionary. Why can't I be like Billy Graham and change the whole world? Because you're a missionary, and God puts you where you're at for a reason. You know how long it, I, I struggle with the idea of people saying, well, we'd like to introduce you to our children's pastor. Hi, P Pastor Dave. I'm like, hey, children's pastor. I'm bigger than that. I deserve a bigger title than children's pastor. I didn't really sound like Batman when I was doing it. But in my heart, I was feeling that way. You know why? But God is saying, hey, you little bald monkey, you are put in this position because you're good with kids. You think like them. You ain't, you ain't ready for that. I don't know if God calls people little bald-headed monkeys, but I feel like that's what he was speaking to me as. He said, you have an ability, and I've given you a talent, an opportunity. You just got to use it for where you're at. And this is where you're at. So go down there and give candy out and love those kids and preach the gospel. And deal with it. And then Tony walks by and says, ain't that right? <laughs> but he is not here right now. <laughs> okay, we are off track. I really don't even know where I'm at. A servant is entrusted with a great responsibility according to... That's where we're at, according to his abilities. We have been given some talents. And you have the ability to use it well. To invest in this generation and increase the kingdom. I, a servant is also entrusted. Are you all with me? Yeah. Yeah. To increase the master's wealth. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. Multiplied, he increased it. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But there he is, verse 18. But he that had received one went, digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. We are not told how they traded uh, with their talents, how they increased their money, whether they had an... Uh, an investment they made. Maybe they sold some things and made more money. I, I don't know. I don't know how it went down. All I know is they increased what they were given. They multiplied what they were given. A servant is to invest what he is given, to increase the master's wealth and do it well. But then there you got that knucklehead that said, nah, nah. I don't even trust the master. I'm going to bury it that way he can't get all upset because I wasted the money. It's still here. I'm just not going to increase the money. I'm not going to multiply it. He reminds me of Christmas. I know this is weird. This is just what came to my mind. 
He reminds me of the grandparents. Grandparents can be a curse sometimes. When your kids are little, they buy the things that take an army to put together for your kids. And he comes in, and grandpa's all excited for the kids, and the kids see this massive box as big as a house. And it's a backyard playground. And he says, this is for the kids. Daddy, let's put it together. Let's put it together. And you're like, no. Why don't we just eat, and then we'll focus on the Lego set, and we'll get to that tomorrow. The kid's like, okay, Dad. And then they go, and they do their thing. And the next day, like, Dad, you put it in the garage. Why don't we put it in the backyard? And he's like, tomorrow we will put. Dad, it's already paid for. All you have to do is build it. It's been given to you. There's even instructions in a big picture on the side. No. And he waits. And a year goes by and it's still in the garage. How many know what I'm talking about? You've been there? It's usually a large Lego set. You've been there. Another year, another year. And finally, all of a sudden, you're standing in the garage. Your son shows up and he says, Dad, is that the playground set? Yeah. And you look at him and say, you want to put it together? Dad, I'm 21. I'm going to sell it online. What are you talking about? You've done nothing with which you were then given. What is it worth to me now? Well, it's still here. Look at it. That's not the point. It wasn't made to stay in a box. You were supposed to do something with it. You would have, it would have affected my life, but you just sat on it. And that's what we do so often. A servant is to invest, to increase the master's wealth, not to sit on it, to serve the master well. How can we serve the master well if we are not investing with what we've been given? So here's what happens. (laughs) He comes back. Verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. He's going to settle some things. And so he that had received the five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained Beside them, five talent more. And his Lord said unto him, what? Well done. Thou good, and key word here, faithful faithful servant. The Bible says the master returned after a long period of time, and a period of time that they knew not of. Jesus Christ is coming back, and we don't know when. And it is easy to get comfortable with not doing anything for the Lord. It is easy to get comfortable not preparing. You know what made them a faithful and good servant? Because they were continuously serving. This is something we miss. They didn't just go out and say, all right, I did my job. I increased what he's given me. Uh, I multiplied it. I'm done. They were constantly attentive to the needs of that wealth that was given to them. Do we need to invest in this? Do we need to change this? Do we need to sell this? Constantly working and serving. They never stopped. This is the only way I can put it. This is the best way I could put it, I guess. I don't know if Tony will like me giving this illustration, but it happened. It happened. When me and Tony were in high school, we were given a responsibility. We were entrusted. We were called out servants, entrusted to do something well. And it was house sit. We were going to house sit for a very wealthy man when we were in high school. His name was Mr. Harmon. God rest his soul. He has passed on, and this was a long time ago or I would not be given this story. It was a beautiful house. He walked us through the house, and he said, this is my dog. I don't remember the dog's name, and it was like half dead. He said, these pills, you have to shove down his throat, help him swallow, just rub, rub, rub. And I'm like, Tony? And then we walked through. We did some other things. He explained what we're doing, and the master was going to leave for a long period of time. Okay? We knew when he was coming back. And he left, and he said, make sure you keep the house clean. Take care of the dog. And he really said this, if the dog dies, walk outside, and I'm going to show you where to bury him. I'm like, what? Tony. So he showed us all these things to do, and then the master left. Here we are, this really cool house. We come home from work, hang out. He said, don't let anybody come over to the house except family. That rang through my ears. And Tony said, you know Bubba is family. We've known him since we were like eight years old. Call Bubba. So Bubba came over. I know, don't judge us. We hang out. We buy pizza. We we watch movies. 
We left the pizza out. Ants started making their way, and we thought, let them eat. We'll get to it tomorrow. We'd, get, we'd be drinking Coke and enjoying ourselves, and things just built and built, and the trash became a pyramid of problems. But we left it too. And then one day, <clears throat> I drove up in the driveway, and I saw the master's car. I was like, this is, not, this is not when he's supposed to be back. Why is, he, why is he here? We didn't even have a cell phone. I just had to find a pay phone. Ding, Tony. Tony, we got a problem. Master is home. And the house is trashed. I will never forget that feeling walking into that home and looking him in the face with the trash mounted high, pizza boxes everywhere, and he, he did what the master did. He threw us out. My mom was the one responsible for keeping his house clean, but we took on that responsibility for that week. Yes, she lost her job. That's not funny, I know, but it's been years. She's forgave us. Let's move on, okay? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. What you're thinking right now, how could a pastor, Tony, do such a thing? But he did it. <laughs> and we will hold him accountable, though it's been years. The point and the moral of the story is this. We knew when the master was coming back, so we did nothing with the time we were given. We would have waited to the last minute and probably stayed up all night and just put it together as fast as we could. There was no sincerity of the heart. We did not care what the master's wishes were to keep the house clean every single day, to take care of the dog daily, to make sure nobody comes over. All we did is dig a hole and we put it away in the back of our mind, and it was too late when the master showed up. Let me tell you something. Two servants were praised for their job well done, and here's the reason why. Because they did not procrastinate. They were productive, and they were prepared. I wonder if we're ready to invest. In order to invest and increase the master's wealth, you have to serve the master well. Let's close with this. In the end, a servant will be rewarded. The Bible makes it clear that both of them were rewarded equally. The two, the one that had five and the one that had two. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in the joy of the Lord. You have done a well done job. What was the difference between the two? This one? had two. This one had five. But it didn't matter how much they had. It mattered what they did with it. You say, well, I want to teach a class like John Sullivan in here. I don't want a little life group. No. You've been given a responsibility according to your ability. Own it and do it well. Because in the end, you're going to stand side by side with the big wigs. Doesn't matter if they're a big shot. Doesn't matter if they're a TV evangelist. You're going to be treated equally because you were given what you could handle and you did it well. And in the end, the servant is rewarded. Rewarded equally, but he's also rewarded accordingly. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is not a work salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. None of us are working to get to heaven or we'd never get to heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Is that clear? This lordship salvation is a lie. The idea that you constantly have to serve in order to get to heaven. We serve because we are going to heaven. The servant was able to enter in because he was willing to serve because he knew and loved the master with all his heart. If you're a true believer then you'll act like a believer and you will serve as a believer. If you do nothing for the kingdom, if you sit on your hands and do nothing for the kingdom, then you need to question yourself if you're a true servant of Jesus Christ. It is so clear that the last servant was cast out according to Scripture. He got his due reward. Then he, which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a what? Hard man. He said, basically, I don't trust you. I know how you are. I was afraid. In, G in Matthew chapter 24, uh, it was talking about the servant, the evil one, and what was in his heart. 
And he chose a direction not to follow, even though he was given the same opportunity, he was given the same ability, but he chose to deny it. And the Bible says he was cast out. One day we will stand before God, and it is very clear when we do what the Bible says concerning those that claim to be believers and those that are not. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Verse 30 of Matthew 25 says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Dave, does that mean if I don't serve well, I'm going to be thrown into hell? No. He was given an opportunity that was representing truth. You can take this and use it and apply it and run with it. All of them were given an opportunity. But he chose to deny it. He's like a fruit tree. He's like the tree that claims to be a fruit tree but never has any fruit. If we were walking through a field and there's apple tree, apple tree, apple tree, and all of a sudden you came a tree and there's no apples on it, and a big sign says, I'm an apple tree, I'd have a hard time believing you're an apple tree. Because where there's root, there is fruit. And we as believers will produce fruit, not to go to heaven, but because we are going to heaven. We please the master because we love the master and we trust the master. Let me make sure you understand this. If you are here today and struggling, wondering where are you in life, are you a true servant of Jesus Christ, then start asking yourself this question. What have you done for the master? What have you done to invest in this generation to increase the kingdom? Because he is not here yet, but he will return. And when he does return, he wants to know, what have you done for me? Because if you're truly my child, if you're truly a child of the king, then it will show some fruit in your life. I am a firm believer with all my heart that there should be some clear-cut, obvious signs that you have trusted Christ. We live in a world as you, you do as you please. We are not faithful servants. Ah! And we don't even realize we are just like the man in so many ways that buried his talent. And said, I'll get to that. You know what that is? That represents the person that goes through life saying, yeah, I heard the truth, I've been to church. But I'll get to that some other time. I'm just, I'm not there yet. I'm working on it in my own way. Are you? Today's the day of salvation. Say, I don't have time for that. What about my life right now? You Christians have so many restrictions. To you it's a restriction. To me it's a pleasure. Because what I do is for God's glory and my good in the end. I want you to notice something that most people overlook when they finish up the parable. And I want to speak directly in closing to you that are believers. To you that have been given a talent and you actually did something with it. I don't know why God laid this on my heart, but this is something that I feel strongly about. I believe that we have been given five talents. Some of you have been given ten. I know some of you have been given two. Whatever you've been given, most of us take, let's say, that five. And we put it to work in Awana. Where we are an usher. All right, we're part of the youth group. We're part of Sunday school. I've been a Sunday school teacher for umpteen years. I've been a part of every event at this church. I've been on this side of the wall of the church doing my job. I have taken the five talents and invested in three. You say, what? You've been getting five, but you've invested in three because you've been inside the church walls and never thought about what's on the outside of the walls of the church. You say, where are you going? I'm going where Jesus went. Following the parable of the talents, Jesus closes by giving the disciples a clear-cut understanding of what they're in to invest in. Because Jesus knows that we can easily overlook the most obvious thing that he's given us to do. Truth and love. Watch what he says. 
chapter 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them, on his right hand, the ones that are believers. This is clear cut what scripture is saying. These are the believers. These are the ones that have been given an opportunity. They've taken advantage of the opportunity that they've been given. Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom of prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in, naked and ye clothed me, sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when did we do this for you? When, when were you hungry and we fed you? When were you thirsty and we gave you to drink? When, when did we see you as a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when did we see you sick or in prison? When were you in prison, God? He said, and the king answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I am not going to be popular with what I'm about to say, but you must hear the truth. If you will stand inside the walls of the church and continue to increase the kingdom with only in the walls of the church, then you've missed what God is trying to say. You have been given five talents, but you've only increased three because the three you've increased are right here. They're right here. You say, I can't do anything else. Not one time in this passage of Scripture did he say, pass out a track. Not one time in this passage of Scripture did he say, be a deacon. Not one time did he say, be over vacation Bible school and serve well. Are those talents? Yes, they're great, they're wonderful, but they're not everything. Because Jesus brings up the things we're missing most. What's on the other side of the church wall? I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of being on this side of the wall of the church. You say this isn't good enough? No, it's not good enough because Jesus said it wasn't good enough because he said you gotta go past it. I know it's not popular, but I am sick and tired of being an average pastor. I do not wanna settle anymore for only reaching those within the walls of the church. I wanna get past just being the average usher. I am tired and sick of everybody just focus on, I've been a deacon for 15 years. I am tired of everybody saying it's good enough because I go to Sunday school. I'm tired of just doing vacation Bible school in every event. You're angry. Yes, I'm angry because the world's going to hell and I can't see it because of the stained glass window. It stopped me from seeing what's going on outside. And it stopped all of us because I've been given five talents and I've only used three of them. I've only used three of them because the other ones are on the outside saying, help me. I'm naked. I need to be clothed. They're in prison saying, visit me because I'm the outcast. They're the ones that are hungry, and the poor, and the ones we pass and say, he's just a druggie. He's just gonna use it for something he shouldn't. And God says, you know what? Why don't you get off Instagram? Why don't you stop worrying about your life group and make a difference for Jesus Christ? I am challenging you with all my heart to rise up, to rise up, to rise up and look past the walls of the church. Because if we don't look past the walls of the church, we will not stand before the Savior and hear, well done, my faithful, my good and faithful servant.